have uh, British guests in the audience, so let's try to keep with our British tradition as long as we can, right? So it's two o'clock. Welcome you all to the afternoon session. Uh, before I actually introduce the next talk, let me just maybe give a few quick announcements. So as many of you just had lunch now, perhaps we should have told you in advance that there is a vegetarian option for those who, who want the vegetarian option, but this should be asked when you pay for the ticket, okay? I, uh, I'll make sure that maybe tomorrow this will be better advertised by the owner of the restaurant. What are the vegetarian options? That's announcement number one. Announcement number two, today after the afternoon talks, there will be a cocktail offered by the, the, the conference, right? It's gonna be right outside. All right, so this cocktail usually involves some drinks, of course, and some appetizers. And you may or may not wanna make dinner plans for afterwards, that depends on each person. Usually it's pretty well enough for me. Uh, third announcement, there will be a dinner on Wednesday, right? So, and uh, this dinner is about, we have the price there. We need a head count by Wednesday, Wednesday at noon. So if you want to join the dinner, you want to pay, you would like, it would be wise to pay before Wednesday at noon, right? The price is 150 reais, which is about 50 US dollars. It's the nicest Brazilian steakhouse, so it's a great experience. Uh, and uh, that's a good deal for us in terms of discount with this restaurant because this price actually includes everything. So it's all included, not only meat, but all the drinks, dessert, coffee, whatever, right? So you can have a real night of Brazilian caipirinhas. Uh, I'm sure that Steve will have his share of Brazilian caipirinhas that he's giving the last talk after five last week. He's gonna give his sixth lecture in this meeting. So after these three quick announcements, let me introduce. There are, okay, yeah, Fogo de Chão is an all-included buffet. There are vegetarian options. I mean, of course, the, the main propaganda is for the meat, but there's a whole buffet of vegetarian options and seafood if you, if you prefer, okay? Uh, all right, so let me introduce, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Steve Gonick from Rochester, who will be talking to us about large values of the zeta function at its critical points. Well, <clears throat> I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, this is my first time in Brazil, and this weekend I had my uh, probably only opportunity to see the sites, so, and I highly recommend them. The, the, the place is gorgeous. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about large values of the zeta function at its critical points. This is a a very classical talk, so um, uh, I hope that's okay. Uh, I'm going to start with with um, well, oops, no. <clears throat> I'm going to start, this is joint work with Hugh Montgomery, and I'm going to start with uh, a reference to Littlewood's uh, work that you actually, you, you saw earlier at the beginning of Brian's talk this morning. Um, <clears throat> he mentioned uh, w these results uh, and the Q analog of them. So uh, Littlewood in 1925 showed that uh, the limp soup of zeta on the one line, so you go up to one plus i t, and then you divide by log log t. The limb soup is bigger than or equal to e to Euler's constant. And uh, so this means that infinitely often as you go up the one line, the zeta function gets as big as this constant times log log t, this constant minus epsilon for any epsilon. Okay, so classical result of Littlewood. And uh, he also showed that if the Riemann hypothesis is true, <coughs> then uh, the limb soup is bounded by twice that same constant, okay? So the first result is unconditional. Second is, is, uh, is just a factor of two away from uh, the lower bound. Uh, this is, uh, so this is kind of remarkable that you, you get the answer to uh, within uh, a small interval. Um, now, in fact, we don't know, <coughs> in the second case, we don't know uh, 
off RH if, if this thing is bounded, uh, right? In fact, I mean, we have bounds like zeta of one plus it is, is uh, big O uh, log t to the two-thirds from Vinogradov's method. Is it two-thirds or three-fifths? I forget which. Uh, but anyway, some, something's, uh, it's a power of a log, and um, so you really need RH to know that this is even bounded. Uh, so what's the right answer? Is it something in between? Well, some of us conjecture, uh, and I think Littlewood conjectured this, uh, that it's the lower bound that's the right size. Okay, and this is a, a, has been a big problem over the last hundred years. Uh, I heard Andrew Granville call it the one or two problem uh, the first time I saw it given a name, and I, I like that. Um, so is the one or the two closer to the correct result? <clears throat> okay, so what do I want to talk about? I'm going to talk about something similar. I want to know, does the zeta function get large at its critical points? That means points where it's, the derivative vanishes. So this seems pretty abstruse uh, when you first hear it. Why, you know, why would you uh, ask such a question? Uh, but there are reasons, and I'll explain them as we go along. Uh, so the answer, though, in order to attack the problem, uh, you, you could answer this in the affirmative um, if you could prove an analog of Littlewood's result, where you uh, don't go up and down the one line, but you uh, look at, uh, <coughs> you sample zeta at, places where the derivative of zeta is zero. And uh, in this case, we'll take uh, beta one. So zeta, rho one will be a typical zero of zeta prime. And uh, here I'm gonna focus on beta ones bigger than or equal to one. So I should say, <clears throat> for those of you don't, who don't know, the, the zeros of the, of the zeta function are in the critical strip of the complex plane between uh, real part of S between zero and one. But the derivatives uh, move, uh, go outside of the critical strip. They're an infinite number to the right uh, of one. They don't go arbitrarily far to the right, but they, uh, they do get outside. Uh, let's see, there's a value between two and three, uh, I believe, that, you know, where the cutoff is. And there's, <coughs> there's no uh, zeros of zeta prime to the right of that. Okay, so our row one will be uh, a typical zero of zeta prime that's outside the critical strip. Okay, and we want to sample those and see if zeta itself gets big at such points. <clears throat> okay, so I'll come back to how this uh, would answer whether uh, zeta gets large and, and why we're doing this. But here's, here's what we're able to prove. So first we have unconditionally uh, that uh, if uh, row one runs over values of, the ze of zeta prime uh, that are equal to zero and beta one is bigger than one, then the limp soup of mod zeta at such points, at critical points, divided by log log gamma one, so that's like the log log t for zeta on the one line, is bigger than or equal to a quarter e to Euler's constant. And uh, so that's an unconditional lower bound, like Littlewoods, analogous to Littlewoods. And for the upper bound, we also have to assume our h. This, this wasn't surprising. Um, so you run over the same points, then the limb soup of the modulus of zeta divided by log log gamma one is less than or equal to a half e to the c naught. And notice the, um, the two values, <coughs> the lower and upper bound, differ by uh, a factor of two. Okay. It's the same factor of two that um, uh, is responsible for Littlewood's, the discrepancy in Littlewood's upper and lower bounds. Okay, what do we conjecture? Well, uh, uh, we conjecture that the lower bound here also is, is the correct value. Okay, so those are the results. I'm gonna indicate uh, how we approach this, but before I do, I wanna try to motivate the question a little more. Um, so this question arose from a question of John 
uh, Thompson, uh, who asked Hugh um, whether for large values of C, uh, there will always be infinitely many compact connected components of the level set mod zeta of S equals C. So this is a very geometric question. One thing I like about this is uh, we don't uh, think about these sorts of questions too often. We haven't for quite a while. Uh, in, the, in the 30s, Spicer wrote a paper that was very geometric, and some others have appeared um, uh, recently. But I think there are some really fascinating questions about the geometry of the zeta function that are, uh, uh, lead to a lot of insight uh, in, in other things uh, connected with zeta. Okay, so, um, so Thompson was uh, working with Peter Sin on a couple of papers that, uh, where they had some interpretation of Dirichlet series uh, uh, connected with something they were doing. I forget now what it was, but he had a list, Thompson had a list of, of uh, very geometric things he wanted to know about the zeta function. Some of them were easy to answer and well known. But others like this, uh, we don't think uh, were uh, known. So, uh, all right, so, so he wants to know if you take a large C, and actually what, he, what that means is C is bigger than one. And I'll show you some pictures in a moment that, uh, so you get some sense of uh, what's going on here. Uh, so you take a large C, uh, um, are there an infinite number of connected compact components? Um, and our first theorem that I showed you before, the, the lower bound unconditional theorem, actually answers this because uh, this, this shows that the zeta function gets large at critical points, and I'll show you geometrically what that means for this question in a little bit. <coughs> okay, so first, here's some pictures. Um, so these are, I'm gonna show you level curves the modulus of zeta of s equals, uh, in this case, 0.2, and I'll, I'll increase the, the, the number as we go along. Um, so here, what you see are these com compact connected components of level curves. And they surround zeros, the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function. Now, in all these pictures, I just, randomly uh, chose a height, so the, the T height is 150 to 170, and um, <clears throat> these little uh, loops uh, are, have a zero inside, as they must, if you know some complex analysis. Okay, so now let's increase 0.2. So, um, so if you imagine the surface mod zeta of S, Z equals mod zeta of S. So if you graph that surface, you look at a zero, then, um, uh, you know, up from the zero, the, you know, the surface is sort of funneling out generally. Uh, okay, and you're seeing at a, at a particular height, you cut through that and you get these curves, that height. <clears throat> okay, so here's, uh, mod zeta equals 0.3. So uh, you're going higher and, and uh, these, uh, you, you, you move naturally, tend to move away from the zeros where zeta is smaller. So the loops are, are getting bigger. Okay, and the next one. Now, uh, a couple of things have happened here. Um, first of all, I think this zero, let me go back. Yeah, yeah, so, so we didn't see Notice this zero here, there's a loop there that we didn't see before. <laughs> presumably, I haven't checked it, presumably that's because it was, you know, uh, it was too tight before to see on, on the graphics I, I did. Uh, but another thing is that here and near the bottom, two of these loops have merged. Let me go back again to the lower height. You see? So those. Keep your eye on either one of those, and you'll see that they've connected and absorbed each other. <clears throat> okay, and here we have more of the same. Things are getting bigger. We're going up. We're taking higher cross sections. So uh, to get that height, you've got to move away from the zero. 
So this is mod zeta is 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Uh, so you see more these things coalesce. Now there's something interesting right there. So that's a point where um, two of these things ha have merged. It's the exact place. So you see uh, this guy and this guy are exactly, when I go to the next height, it's like they're exactly touching the, those two. <clears throat> okay, I point that out because that's a critical point of zeta. That's a place where zeta prime is zero. And now these are getting bigger. Here we are at 0.99. Okay, now I'm going to go to 1, and something new happens. These curves go out to infinity on the right. right? Some do, some don't. Okay, and it's, it's easy to understand why that happens. There's nothing new there. But um, now we're going uh, to level curves higher than 1. And these guys from, that are going out to infinity are, are closed back up. And now the picture looks a little different from uh, when the C was less than 1. Okay, so we're getting bigger. Okay, and there, there too you see, uh, you know, a, a compact connected component connect with this longer thing. It, okay, and now it's opening up, so I'm going higher and the picture looks like that. Okay, another coalescence. Uh, okay, and now those compact components have disappeared, and we have this one connected, uh, one connected non-compact component, and as the size of the level set gets bigger, it moves to the left, and it, this is natural because the zeta function is bigger to the left. Okay, there's mod zeta equals 20. Okay, so I just wanted to give you some pictures. Um, let's see, it was just, yeah. Now, the compact components haven't entirely disappeared, just from this picture. If you go up higher, they're still there, okay? And Thompson's question was, uh, if, uh, the modulus is C bigger than 1, are there still infinitely many of them, okay? There's none in this picture, but there are higher up. Okay. All right, so, um, so as I pointed out, when, you, when uh, if you're at a critical point, those are places where two level curves coalesce. Now, the two level curves could be compact connected components, or one might be and the other might be this non-compact uh, set. Okay, but in any case, in either case, th at least one of the two is a compact connected component. And our first theorem said that there are infinitely many critical points uh, where the value of the zeta function is this big. So, how does this answer Thompson's question? If you take uh, a C slightly less than the value of zeta at the critical point, so uh, if you can get this big, you take a C that's just slightly less than that, <coughs> then, um, you know, that at that uh, critical point, uh, two or one of these connect components is, uh, they're co coalescing. So, um, you're getting a level set that's that high, okay? So the zeta function gets big, gets that big at those critical points. So uh, if there are infinitely many such points, and we show there are, then uh, you know there's uh, uh, very arbitrarily large compact connected components. Uh, it turns out that if you have a compact connected component, then uh, you don't have, you can't have the same one just getting bigger and bigger. They're, they're confined uh, to, to um, intervals. The, the uh, vertical height can't be bigger than constant log t. So this means that we can get an infinite number of compact connected components that where zeta gets big and they're separated. So, um, so there definitely are an infinite number. 
Okay, so let's, uh, let me remind you of what the second theorem was. This was the one that assumed our age, and uh, we want to show that the limb soup of the modulus of the zeta function at critical points is uh, divided by log log gamma one is bounded by this constant. So um, how does this go? Um, <clears throat> if you look at this Dirichlet polynomial, this is a truncation, you'll recognize it, uh, if you're in the subject, it's a truncation of minus zeta prime over zeta. Okay. So uh, here's a lemma. Uh, choose an arbitrary positive constant and uh, take a point to the right of one. If the real part of this, trig this Dirichlet polynomial is bounded by that constant, then uh, at the same s and for the same length polynomial, if you just modify the polynomial a little bit, put a log n in the bottom, then the real part of that can't be too big. It can be at most this, okay? Okay, so if, so think of this as minus zeta prime over zeta. If the real part of this is not big, then the real part of this related thing is not too big. Now, what is this related thing? Well, that's what you would get from this if you integrate it. So if you integrate minus zeta prime over zeta, say from infinity over to a point, then you'd get um, log zeta. So the real part would be log of the modulus. So, so uh, you, <coughs> we're gonna use this to uh, figure out if we're near a critical point of, of zeta of zeta, in other words, a zero of zeta prime, and this to see how big zeta is, because this is related to log zeta. Okay, so <clears throat> turns out that this inequality here is best possible, and uh, it's a simple exercise. If you're a, a student and you want to want to try this, uh, uh, if you go, if you take sigma equal to one, and you you have p to the it is about one, and for uh, primes up to root x, and the rest of the p to the it's are pointing towards minus one. Um, and you can arrange things like that by Kronecker's theorem. Um, then you can actually show that this upper bound is attained. Okay, simple exercise. Okay, so let me let me show you the proof. Uh, it's not not too bad. Uh, so I want to show that if this is less than or equal to C, then this happens. So uh, I'm going to take C minus this. So zero is less than or equal to C minus the real part of V. And I'm going to multiply by two over log X. So that's the thing you see here on the first line. So that's the assumption. And then um, I add the real part of this Dirichlet polynomial to both sides of this expression. So you see it here, and then this first term here is the same thing as this, okay? Nothing else has changed. <clears throat> and now, for n's up to root x, um, for n's up to root x, this term is bigger than this term. What I'm doing here is, is replacing s by one, okay? Uh, that makes things bigger in absolute value. And I'm putting absolute values around the terms. So this is positive, so that looks just like it did before. This term is the same as this. And then this term is the n's between root x and x. Well, if n is between root x and x, uh, this is negative. So when I put absolute values around things, I have to switch the order, and that's why you see this. Okay, and now it's an elementary uh, uh, exercise uh, to use some basic results on prime number sums. Okay, one is this, and another is this. If you just use these two uh, uh, expressions and just, just evaluate everything you see here, there's nothing, no partial summation, nothing else to do, then uh, you get the result, uh, the result being that the real part of this sum is less than or equal to that. Okay, so 
So it's very straightforward, but it also indicates, indicated to us what, um, where the extremal situation was. <clears throat> okay, so now let's see how you prove the theorem. So we're assuming RH, <clears throat> and if I take a, a big height, little t, and sigma bigger than or equal to one, then um, you can easily prove that zeta prime over zeta is approximated by this truncated Dirichlet series. You can actually get a better error term than this, but all I need for the moment is big O of one. Uh, if you used the, bigger, the better error term here and you integrated this from, minus, from infinity to over to the point you're interested in to the right of one, then you would get the following. <clears throat> you get an expression for log zeta that looks like this, okay? So, <clears throat> in the first sum, let's put a critical point of, ze of the zeta function, so a place where zeta prime is zero. All right, so that means this side is zero. Put this on the other side, take real parts, and uh, what, what this says is that the, this, this, the real part of this sum is big O of one, okay? So that fulfills the hypothesis of that lemma. If you, if you had this expression, the real part being less than a certain constant, <coughs> then, um, then that tells you that for the same point, same row one, uh, that this can't be too big. And this is what you get for that. So this is just plugging into the lemma at a critical point. <clears throat> okay, and now uh, our x, our x here is log of t squared, so you put that in here, so you get a log log t, a plus log 2, or, or log log 2, um, and so on, and then um, that is related to the real part of log zeta, it's close according to this expression. So. Uh, the log of the modulus of zeta at row one is bounded by a log log t and stuff. Exponentiate and you get this. So this is where the upper bound comes from on RH. <clears throat> okay, so now let's go back to the unconditional theorem. So here we want to show that uh, at critical points, the limb soup is uh, bounded below limb soup of mod zeta at critical points divided by log log gamma one is bounded below by this. Okay, we're again gonna use approximations um, to various things. So um, Vx of s was, well here's Vx of root x. So this is the thing we saw before. So that's like minus zeta prime over zeta. And I'm going to form uh, a, a something that's a difference of two such things. So um, this guy is v of root x. If you double it and then subtract v of x, this, this has the stuff up to root x in it. So that takes off one of the v of root x's that you, so, so this is the same thing. And uh, if you use Perron's formula, uh, which is a standard tool for, for uh, getting hold of truncations like this. Um, the pull of the zeta function at one gives you, if you uh, work things out, you get an expression for w that looks like this. Okay. This means that, if you look at it closely, that there's a zero of w uh, at, right around this point. I'll show you that in a, in a different way in a moment, okay? So uh, if you take, if you let C0 be this circle, so this is a circle centered at this point, and then you go around it, so uh, you take a radius two, e, 2 over log square x more. So notice C0 is gamma's, uh, Euler's uh, gamma factor, uh, and that's about 0.57. So four times that is bigger than two. So this expression here uh, uh, is, uh, the real part is, is positive. So uh, this, this circle is in 
is to the right of the critical serve. It's in the right half plane, to the right of one. Okay, so uh, every series you'd want to write down for zeta, zeta prime over zeta uh, is absolutely convergent uh, on this circle. Okay, and then, <clears throat> so if you put, if you plug in uh, a typical point on the circle into this expression for Wx, uh, you get this. And this makes the zero uh, clear because you can see that as you go around the circle, uh, this is changing argument. Uh, this is going around an image circle, more or less. And so you've got a zero inside. Okay. So here's the same expression for W. And remember that V looked like this. <coughs> and uh, also remember that by um, choosing the, if you uh, use Kronecker's theorem and, and, and find heights tau where P to the IT for the, f for the first root X primes points near one, and the, the rest point near minus one, then uh, if you put that in here, so change S to S plus I tau, this will mimic this, right? You'll get plus signs, well, you'll get plus signs on the first term, minus signs on the second. Okay, so what that's saying is that uh, if you have heights tau like this that do this, then uh, V at such a height uh, will be close to W. And W is the thing that has a zero, <clears throat> so that's good. And by Roux-Shay's theorem, uh, V will also have a zero in the translated disk. The disk that's up a, a bit. Okay. Now, uh, since V looks like this, and for our choice of tau, um, so n to the i tau is one here, roughly, and minus one here, so you have that, then uh, this related expression where you have the same thing as V but with a log N in, in the denominator and then you take the real part, that's going to look like this. Why? Because, uh, well, the, the S is, is close to one um, and uh, on C zero. Um, well, the, the uh, uh, N to the I tau is close to one and uh, for in these terms and minus one in these terms if it was here. So, uh, and this expression now is very close to this. You can show it gets that big. Okay. So, uh, we're almost done with the proof. If, uh, so let Tx be the tail of, this, of a, the Dirichlet series, basically log of S, log zeta of S. So um, if you take a smaller circle than C0, C1, then the real part of log zeta of S plus I tau must look like this. Th this has a, a, an absolutely convergent Dirichlet series expansion. So this is the first part, and then this is the tail. Okay, and if you go back, before you take real parts, differentiate with respect to S, you would get this. Again, this is the tail part. <clears throat> and then uh, we just showed that in, inside this circle, C1, uh, this sum gets this big. So the real part of the log, which is what we want to control the size of, does get large on this circle. And um, um, this, is <clears throat> um, this is, on the same circle, this is close to zero. So minus zeta prime over zeta is essentially zero plus the derivative of that tail. Okay, so <clears throat> um, this means that zeta prime has a zero nearby, and the real part of log zeta is big at such a, a point. So um, what do you have to do? Well, you have to find, there's, just, there's a big catch in all of this. Uh, you, you, we have to find a tau that points the primes up to x in various ways. Okay, well, Kronecker's theorem will do that. Okay, but then the catch is that 
there's no guarantee that the tau that you use there will keep this tail small, or this one. So we've got two tails that we have to control, and the typical Kronecker theorem uh, isn't going to do that for you. So you have to get around that. I'm not going to show you that, but uh, the, uh, this is, I'll just write down what it is we have to show, that uh, the tails are small in these two expressions. Okay, and that's how the proof of the other theorem goes. <coughs> um, so let me just close by uh, pointing out that Tishmarsh, a few years after uh, Littlewood, uh, proved um, <coughs> similar estimates about how small the zeta function can get. So that's phrased like this. I can remember if Brian had these on his, his slides, but um, uh, it's a similar set of ideas. So you showed that the lim inf, so this is saying that, <coughs> you know, infinitely often that uh, zeta on the one line gets less than a constant over log log t. And then uh, on rh, you can show it, it has to get bigger than con another constant lo over log log t as well. Um, and conjecturally, uh, you, you might, uh, here you, you would conjecture uh, for the same reasons as before that the upper limit is the limit, uh, the upper bound is the right one, closer to the truth. Again, there's a factor of two here between these constants. Okay, well, it turns out that the method we developed will allow you to prove uh, analogous results here for small values of the zeta function too at, at its critical. Okay, I'll stop there.